Yemen, an extraordinarily beautiful and little known country, land of the fabled Queen of Sheba, that for centuries was isolated from the outside world by a despotic line of rulers. It's an arid land, dominated by a volcanic mountain massif, where a rural population has from ancient times sustained itself by farming on the intricate terraces that have been carved onto the mountain slopes, creating thousands of tiny steps climbing down towards the Red Sea. This corner of southern Arabia is surrounded by deserts and lies in the same hot, dry climate as its closest sub-Saharan neighbors, Ethiopia and the Sudan. Following Yemen's successful revolution in the 1960s, the Young Republic finally opened its doors to the outside world and to Western aid organizations who were offering modernization and development. One of the technical advisors sent to Yemen to work alongside his Yemeni government counterparts was an agricultural engineer, Anthony Milroy, who came expecting the kind of barren landscape and destitution as in Yemen's neighbors. I was amazed to find the ancient and really unique farming system was still intact and the farmers were operating so successfully that they were virtually self-sufficient and there was none of the terrible environmental degradation of nearby Ethiopian Sudan. You've got to remember that I was living and working with these farmers during the time that the famine was being watched on television developing in Ethiopian Sudan very nearby and in fact the Yemeni farmers were teaching me the real meaning of sustainable agriculture. I mean, there's, there's no question that they have a lot to teach the rest of the world. After drought and famine yet again swept the Horn of Africa in the mid 80s, Anthony Milroy resolved to find ways of transferring the expertise of terrace farming directly to the farmers of the Sub-Sahara who still knew nothing of these techniques. So he returned to Yemen. When I came back, I was appalled to find that this incredible system was in the process of collapse. I mean, these wonderful, fertile highland terraces, true hanging gardens that had been evolved and perfected over 2,000 years in one short decade, they were crumbling and were being gradually swept down towards the Red Sea. Now, 75% of Yemen's farmers are locked into this system. So their livelihoods were threatened and the process was so insidious that in fact nothing was being done about it. People weren't aware of it and there was truly an impending environmental and human catastrophe. But throughout the mountains, Milroy saw clear evidence of collapse and degradation. Previously fertile, well-tended terraces had been allowed to crumble and slide down the mountainside with no signs that the damage was being prevented. It was clearly vital to find out what was going wrong and why. The key had to lie in the thousands of villages that, like the village of Irian, are perched like eyries on the spectacular 3,000 meter massif that runs the length of the country. It's the farmers in these villages that have for generations created and sustained the terraces. Ahmed is one such farmer. Like 80% of Yemen's population, he has always depended entirely on the small seasonal rains for his livelihood. Hey. <laughs> Ahmed's farming year starts well before the early summer rains and is focused on harvesting and storing as much of the precious rainfall as possible to enable his staple grain, sorghum, to survive. He 
each of the small terraced fields that he farms are linked to those of his neighbour by overflow channels. And down each gully, culverts are built so that when rainwater does arrive, it's spread out along the contours and held by the soils before flowing on to the next field. So the terraces, built up over the centuries, trap and use the minimal rain without allowing it to wastefully flow down the steep mountain slopes. <laughs> Ahmed's preparation for the rains includes opening up the hard, dry soils with his unique donkey plough, so allowing in air whilst levelling the field to hold the coming water. And he anticipates the rains with a little early sowing. Ahmed's generation, like his ancestors, live in a world bounded by their fields, the village community, and the local weekly market. It's a simple, self-sufficient life, which has been turned upside down in the past two decades as Yemen has opened its doors to the outside world. Suddenly, the isolated villages have been drawn into the national economy, and the new generation has been presented with undreamt of mobility and opportunities. changes sweeping this Islamic nation have been slower in reaching the rural women. Their role and responsibilities, both in the household and on the farm, have always been considerable. Besides the task of rearing large families, collecting firewood and water for washing and cleaning, they have responsibility for the breeding and rearing of livestock. They also labor throughout the year in the fields at all but the heaviest tasks, particularly at peak periods such as harvest time. The western face of the mountains that dominates the central Yemen 
looks towards the Red Sea. As the mountains plunge lower, so the rainfall decreases, the temperature soar and the threat of drought and famine would seem to increase. In fact, the lower flatland in the valleys, or wadis as they are known, is very fertile and productive. The farmers in this foothill territory known as the Tehama rely on the water and topsoil that is swept down by nature from the mountains. Ahmed's village in the peaks directly provides the lowland farmers and their villages with the means of survival. So, whilst Ahmed anxiously prepares his terraces in preparation for rain in their villages in the mountains, 200 kilometers downstream in the Tehama, another farmer, Mansour, is preparing his land for the floods he expects to flow down the mountains. He not only opens up the rich soils, but also banks his fields to form huge basins that will trap and spread the expected water. The water that the two farmers at both ends of the system share mostly falls in the mountains as August rains. This year, in the mountains surrounding Ahmed's village Irian, the rains are late and the villagers are worried about getting any rain at all. Whilst they wait, daily tasks continue. Since Ahmed doesn't own any land but works as a sharecropper for absentee landowners, he much prefers spending as much time as possible caring for his own prized possession. Whenever he can, force feeding it with nourishing sorghum stalks and leaves. But his family's survival depends more on the produce of the field than on his cow. So no rains on Irian would bring considerable hardship on him.
Lack of rain affects farmer and landowner alike. Irian Sheikh and community leader is particularly concerned that things are worse than ever this year and that without rain, their crops look like failing badly. following week, as the villagers went to their mosque for their Friday prayers, it seemed as though their request at last had been granted. The first late rains fell on Irian. At last, the prepared fields can trap the much needed water. But rapidly, the downpour overflows from the fields and searches out every possible route down the steep slopes, forming small torrents that dash from level to level, sweeping along mountain sediment and washing away any weakened terraces. Right the way round the mountain ridges, small streams link up with each other until they eventually emerge as seasonal rivers into the Tehama at the base of the system. Here, the precious water, enriched with all the soil it's picked up on its path down the mountains, is trapped by dams and barrages. The water is then controlled and siphoned off to be used by the lowland farmers in their parched fields. For farmers like Mansour, the long summer wait is over. The fields he prepared earlier are flooded one by one. The passing flood is diverted and trapped inside the four meter banks that each farmer builds around his fields each year. He fills his field, holds the water for a customary period and then passes it to his downstream neighbor. Each farmer along the course of the flood wants to keep the water in his field for as long as possible. It's not just the water he's after, 
that the three centimeters of new silt that can settle on his land and provide him with a whole year's supply of free fertilizer. As a result, disputes continually break out between farmers, those waiting their turn impatient at those reluctant to let the water flow from their fields. The official whose job it is to mediate in disputes is the water master. Having argued his way to getting extra water and silt, the young farmer finally bowed to the traditional and Islamic authority of the water master and allowed him to arrange for the wall between his field and that of his neighbor to be broken. <laughs> Once the barriers are broken, the gift of water and soil from the mountains continues its life-giving journey. Whilst all seems well down in the Tahama Plain, the whole system from top to bottom is beginning to collapse, with a potentially irreversible breakdown of the mountain farmer's centuries-old terrace system. Some rain did fall on Iriam, although not enough for a good crop. But even in a bad year, nothing is wasted, and as the crop matures, the farmers plough between the rows so as to cover over the roots, and they then strip the leaves to provide fodder for their livestock. Most of the essential techniques that make the system so resilient to drought are in fact labour intensive, the water harvesting, all the sorghum husbandry practices, terrace maintenance. 
but even more important than that, all these individual farmers right down the system are in effect an interlinked chain. You can, I can see that from the, the journey of the rainwaters. So the terraces at the top, which are spreading and slowing the rain when it comes, if you take away some of the terraces at the top of the system, the water becomes focused and the flood accelerates. And you can very quickly have a domino effect right down this chain. So farmers way down the system that haven't changed any of their practices suddenly have a, a different pattern of flood and their diversion structures, which were designed for a particular kind of flood, can't cope. And their livelihoods are put at risk as well. Up in the mountains, the signs of eroding and crumbling terraces can be clearly seen over huge areas. Without trees to bind the soil, and without well-maintained terrace walls to prevent that soil from being washed down by the flash rains, whole chunks of fertile farmland have disappeared down the mountain. Anthony Milroy and his colleague Abdul Rahman began to survey this damage in the Irian region. It was particularly poignant for Abdul Rahman since he had lived there as a boy and now found the place barely recognizable. What was once a forest with wild animals and lush terraces that used to slow and spread the rain and in which Abdul Rahman played and hunted had turned into an area of yawning ravines. The debris washed down into the valleys and increasingly violent floods had changed what was once a narrow camel track between rich coffee and mango plantations into a boulder-strewn wasteland. This disappearance of the land, and with it their means of livelihood, is a matter of grave concern to the mountain villagers, particularly the older generation. Most afternoons, it's customary for them to gather together to discuss village affairs. Such discussions are more and more dominated by arguments about the causes of this new and potentially disastrous situation. Often, their gatherings take place inside a community room, and when visitors from outside the village arrive, it's here that the farmers gather to give vent to their feelings. <laughs> Most of their grievances centre around the fact that they believe themselves to be neglected when Yemen is rapidly developing. Senior members of the new parliament have now also become aware of the serious concerns of their constituents and are looking for ways to tackle them. These terraces have been there for thousands of years. 
and people used to live off those terraces uh, because there was no other way. I mean, if they get washed out, the people will repair them because it was the only way to, to keep those terraces and they grow sorghum, millet, and other uh, agricultural uh, producers. Uh, because basically, you know, uh, Yemen is still depend on agriculture. And over 70% of the people in Yemen are really uh, still uh, farmers and depend on the agricultural uh, uh, areas where they live. So this is an important area, and I hope I, my committee, and also the parliament will do a lot to help this sector. Is this area something that foreign aid donors should also be encouraged to address? Yes, I think it should be. Why not? It's, it's part of parcel of the agricultural development, and uh, it will be really uh, fruitful and useful uh, if we can get uh, other donors to make a donation uh, to this area, and especially to the maintenance of terraces and also of the uh, increase in growing, uh, in, in the increasing growing of, uh, of trees. But tackling the problem in the mountains is no easy matter. One of the causes of terrace collapse is the removal of trees. As with many forested mountain regions elsewhere in the world, trees and shrubs are being stripped to provide essential domestic firewood, both locally and for sale in the towns. The trees on the terraces are not being replaced and leave the terraces vulnerable to fierce rain-fed erosion. One or two landowners seeing the danger signals have been trying to stop the removal, but they are exceptions. One such sheikh forged a local agreement in an area near Irian to stop villagers cutting the trees. In six years, the cover has regrown. But for many villages, it may already be too late. Ahmed and Nasra from Irian described what used to grow on their terraces in the past. children are getting a better education than ever before. But as their fathers point out, it can be a two-edged sword, since the opportunities for the young to find work are outside their village. So many are going to the cities to pursue their studies and the chance of greater material wealth, leaving fewer and fewer young to help their farming parents, who just cannot cope without them. The dramatic economic and social changes in Yemen are thus breaking the chain of traditional farming knowledge handed down from father to son. And the young now want to complete their lessons and go off to the towns as soon as possible.
أتو الله 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 نجيش فلان بس ما أنا عاد أدخل لا يرجع بزاري وقد زميلي قدو كذا كان موظف قدو بجو ثاني It's not only the landless farmers who are losing their sons to the towns. The cities are attracting the landowners and their families away as well. As a result, the population of the capital city, Sana, is increasing at an alarming and unsustainable rate. In the city souk, business booms, and still to be found, are the artisans who make the implements upon which traditional farming has always depended. But more and more, the city and souk undermine the mountain farming system rather than support it, in particular by being the source of subsidized grain imported from the West and sold at prices lower than those that the farmer can get for his own produce, so removing any incentive for farmers from villages like Irian to compete. And if, like Ahmed, the farmers don't even own their land, there is less and less encouragement for them to keep the terraces in good order. المدرجات قاعدة قد تدهورت كثير من المدرجات ولم يبقى إلا يعني المدرجات هذا إذا بقيت مدرجات عاديه عاديه لا تزال عامرة ونظرا إلى أنه يملك هالمزارع الذي يزرعها لكن بالنسبة للملك الذي يملكون يعني أراضي غير مدرجات ومدرجات هذا ولا قد هم لا المدرجات لأن الناس قد أنحازوا يعني هاجروا من الريف إلى المدينة ناحية واشتغلوا أيضا بال... كان الشباب في الماضي غير متعلم كانوا يشتغلوا في زراعة هنا اشتغلوا في التعليم والغيرة. The damage caused by neglected and eroded terraces not only affects the farmers in the mountain peaks as the water flows down the system havoc follows in its wake. The more violent floods of recent years have devastated much of the valley land. In parts as much as 80% has been washed away or covered by up to four meters of debris from the mountains. Villagers who farm these lower slopes are year by year finding themselves poorer and poorer. The valleys they used to farm have turned to rubble and the ground surrounding their homes is too rocky and dry to sustain growth. These farmers have fallen victim to what is happening in villages like Irian in the mountains above them and are joining the exodus from the land. <laughs> Only when the bottom of the system is reached do things seem to improve. Although Ahmed's year has not been very successful, Manso in the foothill plains has at least been able to capitalize on the washed down silt and water and has had a bumper crop.
Although in the Tahama farmers have many other causes of a complaint, lack of water from the mountains is not one of them. But even the freshly fertile land around Mansour is now threatened, because despite massive World Bank investments in barrages and canals that have recently been installed in the wadis and plains to help with irrigation in this sector, the system has been unable to cope with the growing mass of topsoil and debris that's now being brought down from the mountains in the floods and threatens to clog everything. The millions of pounds of development aid received every year by the Yemen is primarily aimed at prestige dams and irrigation projects in the lowlands and plains but by virtually ignoring the less productive farmers in the mountain terraces, new problems have been created and are now affecting everybody. Aid, aimed at providing pumps to exploit more groundwater, is, for example, causing a potentially disastrous over-extraction of the limited groundwater reserves. Shallow wells are turning dry, and saline water is being drawn inland from the Red Sea. Even domestic drinking water for the cities is running out. You all know how difficult it is bringing imports into this country of uh, expensive irrigation equipment and modern irrigation equipment. Um, so what we're showing you today is something which is completely available in Yemen. All the materials for this were purchased in the local souk. And, uh, they, farmers can A few agencies, themselves. such as the British Overseas uh, Development Administration, actively encourage longer-term support and training for small farmers. Here, they are helping the Yemeni Ministry of Agriculture demonstrate the growing and irrigation of fruit trees using simple systems that minimize water use. Similarly, they show how to extract water from under the now dried up gravel filled wadi beds. The Yemeni Dutch Development Cooperation Program also seems genuinely committed to some appropriate development projects which build on Yemeni traditional skills. They work, for example, with local community organizations on new water harvesting techniques for rain fed fruit trees and on building small dams. They've also made extensive surveys to measure the extent of overpumping and its effect on groundwater reserves. But such approaches are few and far between, and rural development specialists are aware that priorities are still wrong and need to shift from short-term, large-scale projects in the valleys and lowlands to longer-term investment, supporting local community needs. It is, uh, of course, easier to, uh, to go to the valley of Damar and drill a well there and have production. And more difficult is, is it to go to the mountain areas and uh, involve the population uh, in the development efforts. It takes more time. Uh, mostly these projects are uh, executed by consultants who have their uh, plan of operation and have to prove that they have done and uh, achieved the targets as has been set. Uh, and, and sustainable development is necessary and that the, let's say, the managerial part to have projects involved with the local population is in the technical assistance organizations not solved yet. But while the debate goes on, so does the damage. And it's up to local communities to try to find their own answers. In Irian, everyone agrees that although they are powerless to affect many of the major problems, they do need some local action. <laughs> يجتمعوا جزء من المفكرين 
ويوجهوا المواطنين ويتوجههم انفسهم على اساس على ان احنا في بدايه الصيف نعيد المدرجات هذه نشجرها لكن المدرجات هذه تشتري عنايه بطول السنه ما تشتري الا فلتوا يجي زعما اذا ما تشتري مقتنع اذا الرعيه لا اصبر خلينا نسكت ما تحتاج عنايه طول السنه ولا شيء اذا هي من الاشياء هذا الذي هي هديه الذي اذا قد نسيت ما طلعت طلعت لنفسها مثل الطلحه مثل الطلحه ما ولا بلا ستر What is encouraging when I travel down the system and you talk to the farmers, I mean, you're aware that they really are capable of remobilizing that tremendous community spirit they've always had in the past. They're aware and know what has to be done technically to reverse this process. And they're also aware that they need outside resources, investment, technical expertise, from central government. Now the real question is, the development agencies, the large multinational World Bank, United Nations, bilateral aid donors that are equipped to inject these significant resources. Since 1947, the UN Charter effectively means that they must work with and through central government. They're not, a, there's no mechanism for them to put their funds direct at a local level. The second thing is that they see it as their brief to increase agricultural production per se. And the Western package of fertilizers, chemicals, pumps, expertise, investment, that is efficiently directed at the 10% of farmers that respond quickest to these kind of investments. So in Yemen, all that money is directed towards the 10% of farmers who have access to groundwater. But where does that leave the other 90%? I mean, for 3,000 years, they've depended on a balance of natural resources, and they have to leave that to the next generation. But those resources are being plundered. I mean, the, the World Bank itself has estimated that within 15 to 20 years, at present cutting rates, there will be no trees left in Yemen. Groundwater reserves will be gone in many areas at present extraction rates in the same period. The soils and the farms in the mountains and the wadis will be gone if this process continues. <laughs> So at harvest time, Ahmed and his fellow mountain farmers reap a poor crop with fewer terraces, less labor, and virtually no outside development or support, their future looks bleak. And concerned agencies may be too late to rescue a system that until recently was a model of sustainable farming. It's a um, long process, I think. It's a uh, bad uh, in funding agencies, in donor organizations. Uh, there is an awareness coming up. Uh, we cannot expect that uh, the amounts are changing within a few years. It will take time and need an adaptation of the organization itself. And, uh, and being aware of what is going to be lost if we don't, uh, it will take uh, decades, I think, before we can really uh, talk about uh, sustainable agriculture with um, uh, farmers feeling that they are not losing anymore but gaining on their uh, areas where they are living. Do you think we have decades of soil and water and trees left in Yemen? That's a difficult question. I think um, whatever we can do, we should do. Uh, I, in that sense, I'm not pessimistic either.